again, welcome. Thank you for all, all for being here. Folks, uh, this is uh, something we look forward to since we become president, and uh, we appreciate you all coming. Just last week, uh, Jill and I had a chance to host another group, the Air Force Academy football team. <clears throat> now, I notice there's only about a quarter of you cheering, but uh, these young cadets are just starting out. They had the same, but they had the same sense of pride. They had the same sense of purpose and the passion, and you could see it in all of them, the same passion that you all possess. You, I don't, you probably don't even realize what you exude, your confidence in our capacities. And uh, I told them that they'd soon be joining that long line of American service members, uh, uh, each a link in a chain of honor. And that's how I think about it. When I think of our son, I think of it as just a chain of honor, each one. Over the years, that chain has grown stronger, thanks to the generation of military leaders you've all trained. And uh, 75 years of a desegregated military, 75 years of women full integration, 50 years of an all-volunteer force. And that's hard to believe because I remember most of that. <laughs> Worrisome. <laughs> Worrisome. As I said at the, uh, at the dinner uh, for the, uh, with, with the correspondence dinner, I said, you know, when Jimmy Madison wrote the con that amendment in the Constitution, I was there. But, uh, <laughs> and everybody said, yeah, he probably was. I mean, <laughs> But all kidding aside, each one of you over the years, this chain has grown stronger. And, uh, and a mark of these milestones uh, as a consequence. So I challenge you to keep strengthening that chain in big and small ways. To keep sharpening our military edge in the field and across the forces. To keep taking on the challenges of today and tomorrow. You know, I mean, when you think about it, there's no question there's never been in each of our minds, but there's no question we have the finest military in the history of the world. That's not hyperbole. That's literally true. The history of the world. <clears throat> and I think uh, other leaders around the world don't share a shame of you as we do are beginning to understand that. In return, you know, the, uh, the fact is, in return, I promise that I will always, always have your back. And uh, our military women and men, we have a sacred obligation, I know I've said it many, many times, to prepare those we send in harm's way and take care of them and their families when they come home and care for them uh, in a way that uh, they deserve. And that's a little bit in dispute right now, but I think we'll get that straightened out too politically. And I also want to take a moment to acknowledge the impressive leadership uh, in these last few months. You've armed, you've equipped, you've trained a proud and brave Ukrainian army and helped them preserve their liberty and their democracy. I spent months in Ukraine prior to uh, all this happening and spoke to the Rada and when they were having their debates about who among the strong men would lead. But I was, uh, I have to admit to you, I was a little bit surprised just how, how courageous, how amazingly brave not only the military is, but the, but, the, but the Ukrainian people. They're just doing an incredible job. And uh, it's because of you, your efforts to evacuate our embassies well, as in, uh, in Sudan, American citizens facilitate that. And the uh, treatment and capabilities and commitments of our armed forces helping American people anywhere in the world. I, I, you probably don't think about it, but you're just in a remarkable, remarkable, remarkable group of people. I, I mean that sincerely, except for Millie. I'm not so sure, sure. <laughs> but uh, actually, I don't want. I'm embarrassed. And I said, you know, I'm going to really miss you. He said, I'm not going anywhere yet. <laughs> don't get sentimental on me, Biden. I'm from Boston. Uh, but uh, you know, you continue to take terrorists off the battlefield. With, per, for, with precision and professionalism, protecting our nation and our allies and interest against the enduring threat. And each and every day, you, uh, you put our nation in the strongest possible strategic position around the world. And that, again, is not hyperbole. That's a fact. Not just in moments of crisis where you deliver as only Americans can, but in the critical day-to-day -day, uh, work of strengthening our alliances from NATO to Japan and the Republic of Korea 
Philippines and Australia. I think the last uh, several years we've had a pretty good run in terms of people stepping up and other nations stepping up. And uh, in anticipation of new threats in areas like space and cyber and building new partnerships uh, like AUKUS. And, you know, taking on the hard missions and trans that uh, transcends all our borders. I mean, it's, it's just amazing. From responding to the global pandemic to addressing historic levels of migration around the world. In fact, our two combatant commanders, General Cavoli, head of the European Command, and General Langley of the African Command, couldn't be with us tonight because they're standing guard right now. They're running, they're, they're doing their job in a critical place in critical ways. They're at their post dealing the war in Europe and a crisis in Sudan. And as you heard me say before, many times I apologize for repeating it, but America is at the world at an inflection point. I used to have a professor in undergraduate school who said inflection points where you're going down the highway 50 miles an hour and you take an abrupt turn right or left 10, 12 degrees, you can never get back on the road you're on. And it's happening again. We're at a place where the decisions we've made in the last few years, the next three or four years, are going to determine what this world's going to look like, not figuratively, literally, the next three, four, five decades. So there's a great deal of stake, a great deal of stake. And most of it is in your hands. You've shouldered the unique demands that come with these changes. And, you know, together we face new challenges, complex threats, and uh, you've remained unflinching, unflinching in your pride, your purpose, and your passion. And that includes all the leaders who will be changing, uh, ch changing out this summer. General Milley, who I really will miss. He's one of the best I think I've ever served or been with. General Berger, and uh, the Marines are going to be missing you, pal. And uh, General, um, General McConville, Admiral Gilday, uh, General Van Herc, and uh, General Dickinson. Um, you know, gentlemen, thank you for your service, and thank you from the bottom of our heart. You have our deepest respect and gratitude. And finally, I want to thank another important uh, group that's here tonight, your spouses and your families. You know, there's that, uh, you also serve. You also sacrifice, and I mean that sincerely. It's not hyperbole. The, uh, you also strengthen our nation. The British poet John Milton once wrote, they also serve who only stand and wait. When Bo was in Iraq for a year, before that he was in Kosovo, I'd watch my wife get up to go to school. But she left a little before me. She'd be standing by the, by the sink, and she'd be mouthing a prayer that the head of the National Guard in Delaware's wife had given her. Many of you have had to wait for that phone call. You wonder what's going on. You just, but you're there. You're there. You allow it to work, whether you're a male or female spouse. You're doing something that is, you're, you're, you're serving the country. It wouldn't work without you. So tonight, I'd like you to please join me in raising your glass. I want to make a toast. To our servicemen and their families, to the chain of honor they create may continue to grow stronger generation after generation. Hear, hear. God bless America.